So I rejoice in the gift of being able to be with you today. And uh, one of the things that's been true is because of our process, I had to be very clear about my retirement date from more than a year ago. And I have never ever had a whole year in which I was saying goodbye to people <laughs> in, in every way that, uh, that one can say goodbye. But, uh, but we are drawing close as of today the South Dakota Conference is meeting, and we anticipate that at that meeting they will elect uh, the Reverend Bridget Stevens as their conference minister and as tri conference conference minister. And we will then have the whole process officially done. So that should happen today. And uh, I look forward to hearing that news, which we will hear later on sometime today. If I get it before we close, I'll be sure that Randy knows so that Randy can announce it. So I want to start um, in, a, in an odd place, but before I do, thank you to the association for giving me this chance to gather with you and to uh, speak with you. So the odd place that I want to begin is, I'm not a great movie goer, but I go occasionally. And I went um, to see this movie that's out, Victoria and Abdul, and I went to see it in part because I like Judy Dench, and if Judy Dench is in it, it's got to be good. But a part of my task as conference minister is driving across Nebraska. And I accommodate that by gifts made to me by my wife and son of books that I listen to when I'm in the car. So I listen to a, a uh, biography of Queen Victoria uh, a few months back and uh, while I uh, enjoyed that because I enjoy English history and for a number of other reasons um, I knew something about what this story had to be about if it was about Victoria and Abdul it had to be about somebody who was called I think the Moochie um, and uh, I said, I don't see how you make a movie out of that. That was a very, very painful and ugly situation in which this woman was infatuated with kind of a servant who was kind of a scoundrel. And how do you make that into a movie? But somebody did. <laughs> and Judy Dench made it a good movie. I mean, that was just a, a gift that she, that she brings. When she's on the screen, you want to like her. Whether that was true with Victoria or not is kind of a different issue. <clears throat> uh, uh, several months back, uh, meeting with, uh, uh, this is the other reason I need to retire, because names just start disappearing and I have to go fishing for them. Uh, it, meeting with Scott at First, at First Central, uh, he, was, he was telling me about a historian who talked about the settling of America having this relationship to English history, which is transparent when you name it, but I had never thought of it. So all of those pilgrim folk, in New England, who are akin to us in the United Church of Christ, those folks were all roundheads. In other words, they were the ones who wanted to kill the king, right? And all of those Southerners who settled in Virginia, they were all the royalists, the loyalists. They were the ones who liked the monarchy. So when you think of American history, and you think that there's tension between the North and the South in American history, well, duh. <laughs> <laughs> That's who we are, right? And it's who we have ever been. We are people who are divided. And I love Scott's image. He said, and of course, then you bring in all of these Scots 
and you settle them kind of down the middle. And sometimes they sympathize with the South, and sometimes they sympathize with the North. And you never know exactly where you're going to be. So, in our New England background, loving the king, or in the case of Victoria, the queen, isn't something that we should be inclined to do. But as human beings, we like celebrity, right? That's just part of who we are as human beings. And this story is, of course, part of the reality that if you can get close to somebody famous, you may get good things that happen to you. So this fellow who was sent to England to be with Victoria had some rather good things happen to him for a period of time because he was her favorite. And being a favorite of the queen tended to have rewards. Now part of the unscrupulous part is that he also had access to those who were visiting the queen and managed to take uh, some of their possessions and pawn them off in the town and they had to go and buy them back. And, but you know, when you're the favorite of the queen, nobody gets to criticize you. They just have to go back to town and buy their jewelry back again, right? <laughs> So Judy Dench makes this a wonderful story, and the, the movie at the end tells us that uh, this man, Abdul's uh, diaries, his journals, were discovered recently. And so they could kind of check his way of telling the story against the way the story has been told. You know, of course, that the people who didn't like him were the people who got to write history because Victoria died. We all, we all know how that happened. But what was happening in history at that time? Victoria was, of course, queen in England when we had the huge eruption of the Civil War in the United States. And Victoria was in this really awkward position because remember who the royalists were? the South. And there were many people in England who would have loved England to have been united in some way or another and supportive of the South. But at the same time, England had gone through its own battle about abolition before that and well before it. So those of you who know that, that story, the writing of the hymn Amazing Grace and what was happening in English society and the painful journey they went through and the way that that changed world history. Um, that piece was there so England could not favor the South because to favor the South was to deny their own decision about abolition. They had to favor the North. If you know that history, you know that England kind of favored the South and kind of danced around that and kind of, you know, uh, acknowledged that there were problems about the need for the abolition of slavery. It was a painful, painful history. Victoria represents a kind of ending of a period in which there was a, a notion that Europe was this incredibly noble place where all good things happen. And in this movie, they give you this visually, but it's something that if you've read history, you know that it's true. She had a lot of kids, and she married them into all of the noble houses in Europe. And so when she died, Kaiser Wilhelm was her grandson, her first grandson, um, and very important. But also, the Tsar of Russia was her son's nephew, right? Uh, and the Tsarina of Russia was her granddaughter. So there was this in, incredible uh, relation that was, that was happening and that was going to lead to World War I and was going to, from many people's perspective, 
destroy everything noble that had ever existed in the history of the world. And if you can't quite grasp your head around that, because we Americans didn't really care much about World War I, uh, the truth is, you know, we got in at the end of the war, and there are lots of debates about whether we should have ever gone over there or not. But that little bit of history, um, if you want to understand World War II, you have to really understand World War I. If you, have, if you want to understand the rise of Hitler in Germany, you have to understand the complicated relationship between England and Germany at the beginning of World War I. And that Victoria was the Kaiser's aunt, or grandmother, excuse me. And that, and that somehow or another, um, therefore, superior to him. And yet, literally, he, because he became Kaiser before her death, was superior to her son, because he was a ruling monarch, and her son was the heir to the throne. So there was this horrific family tension that was part of life. And that tension was going to get played out in public. We in the United Church of Christ come out of certain traditions. And one of those traditions is that we are people who believe that the local church is the best place to experience the gospel. Always. So those of us who serve beyond the local church have a place in the world. And that place is... Uh, uh, is an honored place, but it is always secondary because the, the, the heart of the gospel is the way we encounter it in our own life. Now, the truth is that when you talk about something like abolition, we in the United Church of Christ like to claim on our congregational side that we were there. But that isn't quite the truth because, of course, the denomination wasn't the place that was anywhere. The denomination didn't rule. So what you had were congregational churches who were very committed to abolition, and you had congregational churches, we don't want to talk about it, who were not very committed to abolition, um, and they were competing. Now, not accidentally, the very first congregational church founded in Nebraska, was founded by a person who was an abolitionist, right? He spent his whole life at Yale Divinity School, except for, I think it's four years, and shame on me for not remembering this, in which he founded what is now First Central Congregational Church. So he came to Nebraska to make sure that Nebraska was going to be a free territory. So when we talk about religion and politics don't have anything to do with each other, maybe sometimes they do. Um, and that church uh, <coughs> celebrated its 160th birthday a couple of years ago, and the Fremont church celebrated their 150th birthday this year or and um, and the Nebraska conference dates itself to the founding of the Fremont church because with first central which was then first congregational and then a church that is long since defunct um, at a site where there's a Methodist camp um, just not far from Omaha um, it, and Fremont, we had three churches and therefore we could have an association and when there was an association of churches, then we had the wider church, right? So the Nebraska Conference counts its date from the founding of the Fremont Church. That, that's, the, that's the time that, that we see ourselves as coming into being. That's a long time, 160 years. So we live in this funny moment of time where we are also in a time that we know is transition. Many of us have, have read or heard the statement that every 500 years or so, uh, 
the, the world seems to engage in this big garage sale where things are let go of. Um, and uh, we are kind of on the edge of that. We're celebrating, and I use that word cautiously, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. So Martin Luther did his, you know, hammering the notice on the church door, which my church historian folks have told me isn't quite as dramatic as it sounds, right? Because in fact, they used to just post things on the church door so that they could be debated by the community, and that was a common practice. Made it awful for the person who had to clean that door. <laughs> hate to imagine that, but 500 years ago, Martin Luther began this Reformation that continued to grow and evolve, and that still continues to grow and evolve. We, being where we are in that history, find ourselves part of the Reformation, but we join other denominations who have been longing for the wholeness of the church. So we in the United Church of Christ accepted when the United Church of Christ was formed, our motto that, all, that they all may want be one out of the Gospel of John. Now what's fascinating for me about that story, and it's a deep part of who we are in the United Church of Christ, so this is really a story about a German pastor and an English background pastor, a Congregationalist and an Evangelical Reform pastor in St. Louis who began talking to each other in the 30s as all of the stuff was happening in Europe between England and Germany. So the Evangelical Reform starts, part of the United Church of Christ was almost universally German. That's not completely true because there were Swiss Reformed churches and there were, uh, there were Evangelical churches who had a broader root than that. And because we have Jane in our midst, we absolutely must acknowledge that the folks who came to St. Louis to organize the Evangelical Synod of North America also went to Africa and formed the, what is called the EP Church, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church in Ghana. So the same folks, and there's still a Bremen mission that is very active in Ghana, and Jane knows those folks well from her time there, and I've had the chance to work with them and experience them. They are, God bless them, partners with the Iowa Congress. And that's one of their, their conference partnerships. The Bremen Mission folks are partners with the Iowa Conference. And so I suspect when Bridget comes on board, we may be invited to become partners with the Bremen Mission folk who are already our partners because we partner together in the EP Church in Ghana all the time. We are already partners. But if you remember that story about Victoria, so one of the images, for those of you who like movies, that, that was in a movie that took place in that World, one, World War I period was, uh, was an image of, this war is crazy. It's about who has the most mountains in Africa and why one owns a mountain and the other doesn't. And even though that isn't exactly a good explanation of World War I, it's not disconnected, right? This was family politics. And family politics is what we live in all the time. If you don't live in family politics, you don't have family. I mean, it's just the, the nature of the beast. So the UCC was a German pastor, of course American, and an English pastor, of course, not English at all. His family had been in America for a couple of hundred or even 300 years by that time, who got together and said, you know, this division that we have amongst us is a sin. This division that we have amongst us is a sin. It isn't who God intends us to be. That they may all be one was a dream 
that was put together by an English and German pastor as World War II was festering and developing on the European continent. And it took till 1957 for that dream to become the United Church of Christ. And for those of us who know that history, it took well into the 60s before many of the churches actually voted into the United Church of Christ. And because of the nature of the way we made that decision, evangelical and reformed churches came in together as one, right? So each classes or uh, group of churches voted and they came in as a unit and each congregational church had to vote in one by one by one. But of course, some of those evangelical reformed churches discovered almost instantly that while they had to vote in as one, they could vote out individually. Right. <laughs> and some of them did because they really didn't like what this, what this meant because of course this notion of coming together is an awkward notion. Those of you who are married know that marriage involves compromise and it always involves compromise. It involves compromise because you have two human beings, each of whom see the world slightly differently and that is how it should be. So I won't surprise you if I tell you that my wife did not grow up with my mother telling her how to do things, right? But I did. So we have to deal with that. It's just part of the way we are in the world, that we have to deal with the fact that we come from different places and different histories. One of the places where that has become so clear to me has been in dealing with some of the tension that we experience right now. Tamir Rice was a young boy in Cleveland, Ohio, who was playing in a park, and a policeman thought he was going to shoot somebody and shot him. It just wasn't so. But he was an African-American kid. One of the things that we all know is that had he been a white child playing in the park with a plastic gun, he would not have been shot. I mean, we just don't really have a lot of doubt about that. So somebody has done a study, which I find particularly intriguing, that, um, that we don't actually experience the world quite as objectively as we think we do, and that one of the things that makes a difference is whether an experience happens to you as your heart is contracting, right? When you're having a heartbeat, you're a little bit vulnerable, and so your brain is even more engaged than it otherwise would be in guessing the future. Because at that, at that very second, your brain isn't working quite as well because of what's happening with your heartbeat. And so the, the body is engineered that you predict the future more during that point. Now, if you're a policeman and you're coming to a scene where you are fearful that something's going to happen, does your heartbeat go up or slow down? Well, it goes up. And so the odds of your making a mistake about what you're experiencing get higher. So we live in this time where we're having this hard, this hard discussion about privilege. And I have to tell you that I like to imagine that I just don't have privilege because my parents weren't wealthy, because I was a relatively unimportant person in many ways because I'm short, right? Being, being short or tall. But the truth is I do have privilege. Now, I have to tell you that because I've become the conference minister of the Nebraska conference, to deny privilege now would really be stupid, right? I've been in the Middle East and I have sat in, in in Damascus, outside of Damascus, with the, with the patriarch of the Syrian Orthodox Church. 
Now that just doesn't happen to any kid who comes from Bisbee, Arizona. That happens because you all elected me conference minister. You gave me the privilege to travel in the Mid Middle East and to re and represent you. So all of the money that you've given to one great hour of sharing, and one great hour of sharing once upon a time was an offering that the Presbyterians and the Methodists and the UCC, the Disciples of Christ and several churches, it's gotten renamed over the years, but all of us have used it as a way for us to reach out to the international community and do good work. So in, in, in Syria, which is of course now not a place I could go, I could not go and visit Syria today, but I did go, and at the time, Syria is not at peace with Israel, and so therefore, Syria cannot receive USAID money. Some of you may know Ron Roskins, who is uh, part of Countryside Church and an active person here. Ron Roskins, during the first George Bush administration, um, Herbert Walker, not, not W, um, Ron Roskins was the head of USAID for a while. Um, and carried that responsibility. Well, USAID money makes a huge difference in the world. It's a way that the United States can help bring peace. But Syria can't receive it because it's not at peace with Israel. So I visited in Jordan and saw refugees who were fleeing from the Iraq war in Jordan. And I saw the incredible resources that were spent on them because Jordan is at peace. In Syria, it's that money that the Presbyterian folks and the Methodist folks and the UCC folks give that there is a way for refugees to be cared for. And this, the Syrian Orthodox, the, the patriarch of the Syrian Orthodox Church, was one of those who made all of his churches and facilities open to using that money to help get schools going and programs going and feeding programs for, for those people. And I had the opportunity to meet him because of you, because uh, of, of, of your call, and because of the privilege that, that you have given me a privilege that allows me to be in the world in a different way uh, and have an opportunity both to express your commitments and to live them. So I've been to Ghana a couple of times and we have brought Seth Agadi from Ghana to the United States many times to be part of our life and to help us experience a reality. So I sat with Seth at the UCC General Synod that was in Hartford, Connecticut, when uh, Barack Obama spoke. And Seth said to me, well, will he be president? And I said, no, Hillary Clinton will be president. <laughs> <laughs> um, which did not happen. Seth was back here when Barack Obama was reelected. And I, uh, I did not stay up until the last four was counted. But Seth did. Seth was here in the United States. He was here in Nebraska when Barack Obama was reelected, and Seth was celebrating that good news in a way that I wasn't. And I, I, it's not that I was opposed to Obama, quite the opposite, but I just didn't stay up all night to see the last vote come in. But Seth did. Africa received Obama very differently than many other places did. So it was intriguing for me on my last trip there that Seth's son, who I had met years before when he was still something of a boy, was now a minister serving in a church. And his dad gave him the job of keeping me out of trouble, right? <laughs> so when things were going to be boring at the meeting, his son would take me off and show me different things that, you know, where the missions had done this or the church was doing that. And he and I had a lot of time together. And about a hundred million times, I tried to explain to him why people in the United States 
felt differently about Obama than people in Africa did. And that was a hard piece to try to explain because, quite frankly, it's a hard piece to actually understand. But it's a truth. So I want to come back to the full circle of, of Victoria and this image of her. Um, she, what a, I mean, she ruled for, for the longest time any monarch ever had, any English monarch ever had until now, right? right. And the, now Queen Elizabeth has, has surpassed her. But Victoria had a lot more power than Elizabeth does. And that rule made a lot more difference. And so when she took a fancy to some foolish person, and forgive me, Abdul, for describing you as such, um, it made a difference. It made a difference. We seek to be a church that values every single human being. And we seek to be that church by allowing every single church to be the place and understanding that every single church is the place where the gospel becomes real. So some churches, like First Central, were founded by passionate people who wanted Nebraska to be a site where abolition was priority number one. But by the time we became a state, that was a moot issue, right? The Civil War happened, and the issue was not the issue. But Congregationalists still wanted a spirit to come to you. I am the inheritor of the bravery of people who came to this place. We can only tell some of the stories. There are stories in South Dakota about the relationship with the Sioux folk because the Congregationalists were very active there. And there are good things about that, and there are painful things about that. Because, of course, they suppressed the language, and they tried to teach American culture in ways that we now only shake our head at, but that are real. When we are in this new tri-conference relationship, we will be even more closely related to that Lakota association that we are now. But without that association, we still have been working and constantly trying to find a way to be the people who keep alive the <coughs> spirit where each of us has an enormous amount of freedom to experience God and to allow that experience to help us change the world. A Roman Catholic priest out of this archdiocese of Omaha, who was uh, part of an organization he and I had met through the old IMN, Interchurch Ministries of Nebraska, and we had worked on a rural community organizing piece together. And so we, we knew each other through that experience. Um, and as we began to work on issues together, I would say to him, well, in the UCC, we have this congregational polity. And once he said to me, look, I know that you guys are a minor denomination in terms of America, but you're a huge denomination in terms of history. Mm -hmm. And if you think Roman Catholic churches aren't congregational, you don't understand what's happened in America. I, I enjoyed his comment. Those of us who gather here have a commitment to the United Church of Christ and to a ministry going forth that is one that can be liberating, but it can be challenging because we will never, ever, ever speak with one voice. We will always have to speak with a sense of this is who we are together, or I'm a lone wolf and I'm going to say what I want and you can take it or leave it, I don't care. Thank you. Thank you for being that. People who try to find a way together, 
and people who have the courage to say, no, that's not acceptable. I will forever remember the gifts you've given me, and I hope that as we move into the Tri-Conference, that you will understand that you have gifts to give to the United Church of Christ and are giving. If you think the whole United Church of Christ isn't watching you right now, you are wrong. Some are watching you hoping this fails. Some of you, some are watching you hoping that this is a model that others can take. Because of course, what we're looking at is how much structure do we need beyond the local church? It's a hard question to answer. But we will answer it together. We will answer it without insisting that everybody agree. And we will answer it as people who are deeply committed to justice, deeply committed to transformation, deeply committed to allowing the voice of God to sound in our time, in our place. And that voice is so much more possible when we don't have one person who says, I speak for all. I never do, but I still speak for you once in a while. <laughs> like when I'm with the Patreon, and I say to him, thank you for allowing us to do ministry in your midst. Thank you for doing a ministry that we can't do, because you're here. You and I, do this ministry together, but none of us owns it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.